Hey, it's great to be here. Um, the conference has been really insightful in a number of ways. Uh, you know, I'm generally an IT guy, an IT security guy, so listen to the OT stories and all, everything with OT has been really fantastic. So um, today I'm here to talk to you about uh, SolarWinds attack, and, and this one I'm going to uh, talk a little bit differently. Uh, so this is actually a presentation I haven't done so much in the past, is really what the lessons learned were for the days, the months, the weeks uh, following the event. So. Um, I, I've been with SolarWinds for about five years. I was running security before the incident, still running security now, um, and you know, really went through everything. So let's start with a quick, brief uh, introduction of what happened. So December 12th, um, 2020, uh, you know, early, early in the morning on uh, Saturday, I got a call from our CEO saying, FireEye just called me, and they said that we've, um, you know, shipped tainted code. And what what happened after that was just a whole series of events. Um, you know, with FireEye telling us that that's what happened, we didn't really need to investigate so much. It's not a normal incident. Yeah, you know, the information that they came with was allowed us to be able to, you know, really um, investigate quickly, understand that yes, this was real, no question that it was real. Um, so then the question of who did it impact, what went on, how did we go through this, who was the threat actor? You know, in this type of incident, you really can't spend too much time attributing to the threat actor. You know, you let others do that. Um, but the, you know, the whole process was you know, interesting to say the least. So I'm going to skip over the basics. The basics have been documented. Sunburst has been documented really well by a lot of the researchers. Um, Sunspot, which was the insertion into our code, was documented by many. So I'm not going to go into those details. I'm going to spend the time really talking to you about what it was like. Um, happy to answer other questions after the fact about any details. Session, uh, essentially, the, you know, the threat actor came into our environment, started with email, um, email early on. So they started doing email reconnaissance as early as uh, December 2019. Um, then they came in and did a test run in November. So that test run did nothing. Basically, it was a no-op, but it proved they could insert code into the system. Secondly, then they came back in March with 2,500 lines of code. Uh, that code um, essentially stayed the same between March and June. They didn't put the sort that code into our source control system. They inserted the code into the build environment. So bypassed the source control system, went straight to the build environment, inserted that code into an ephemeral or, or uh, virtual machine that spins up and down, um, and then went away in June. So a lot of mission-centric models were utilized by the threat actor, and that's kind of the threat actor that we have to deal with in the future. So let's start. What was the first days like? Really crazy. You know, as much chaos and a much time sensitive as you could imagine. So this was in the middle of COVID. So we're all working virtually. Uh, we, we get on cell phones, we start talking to people, we understand what happened, we proved what happened pretty quickly. Um, we were able to um, search our back ends and determine, um, hey, is this anywhere? Can we find this code anywhere in our environment? We, the answer was no. We couldn't find the code. We knew it was in product because we can decompile C-sharp code. So we could decompile it and see the code was there. And we figured out the code was in certain versions. So we figured out a lot of information um, in, in basically a day and a half. So Saturday, we stayed virtual. Sunday, we all went to the office. Um, and when I say all, there was probably about 10 to 12 folks that were in our war room. Uh, from a number of different parts of our org to be able to at least figure out what, what, what went on. And one of the goals that we had was, hey, we've got to issue a 10K. So as a public company, we had to say, we have a, a material event that occurred, and here's what that event was. So the language and the terms inside of that 10K were extremely important to have accurate, extremely important to have correct. So. Sunday, all in the office. Uh, by Sunday morning, around 
2.30 a.m. or so, I guess that would be Monday morning, we ended up being able to issue our 10K. And so what do we know at that point in time? We knew that the um, threat actor was mission-centric, very focused on what they were doing. We had information on the threat actor from you know, FireEye and Mandy at that time. We know the code was you know, pretty novel. Uh, we knew the code was well written. We know the code size. We knew that the insertion point, we knew that our source code systems were not done. Um, we knew the campaign was crafted. We don't, didn't know actually who the end target was. We knew the models that were associated. Um, as I said before, we had known that the source code wasn't affected or source code control system wasn't affected, but the build system was affected. We didn't know exactly what, we didn't know exactly how, but we knew enough to be able to say that. We knew the upper end of affected clients. We knew that 18,000 customers had downloaded an affected version. We knew that three versions were affected. So we know that scope of uh, versions that were affected were produced between March and June. We had produced uh, versions after that that did not have the code in it. So we knew those things. And that's essentially what we put to the street on um, Sunday night. So, um, I guess at this point, you know, what are the lessons? You know, first days are beyond intense. It is, you know, crazy. Your incident response program helps, but it is very, very different. It's different than any other incident that you ever have. Um, my team runs our incident response process. We deal with a lot of incidents. So I call everything an incident. I try to practice my uh, incident program with everything. So if you lose a laptop, and the laptop happens to be unencrypted. That's an incident for me. It goes through my process, it gets tied, it gets tagged. Somebody reports a vulnerability um, outside uh, of one of my products. I have 40 or so products. So somebody reports a vulnerability, that gets treated as an incident. So I consider my incident program for basic incidents pretty rock solid. I mean, we do it all the time. This type of thing was so beyond normal that it was um, just not what you had expected. So a couple of things, um, partners. Um, we got really lucky with a partner that we engaged. Uh, believe it or not, it was a legal team. So we used DLA Piper as our legal partner. Now I found out DLA Piper is the largest legal firm in the world, but I didn't know that. Their forensics team was incredible. So their forensics team helped us with a number of things. So their forensics team has uh, the relationships with the right level of the right people to get involved. So when we look at saying, okay, how do we bring in, we start with DLA, then we bring in CrowdStrike's forensics team. So CrowdStrike's team, really threat hunt team. We got B team on day one. By Sunday, we got the A team. So it, it was, um, Getting them involved from the hunt perspective was critically important for a number of reasons. We also involved the FBI, we involved CISA. Um, CISA we were working on was something else. Um, throughout the process, uh, the CISA team was incredible, right? So what they were right there in the dirt with us. They were right there at two in the morning with us. And their whole objective was to amplify the truth. So when they say, and Jen said, that she doesn't want to be a regulatory body, she wants to be helpful in the environment, their motivations are very pure in what they do. So um, you need to make sure that you have a cross-functional team ready. You have to, they have to be ready and willing and able, and you have to have cell phones for them, and you have to have the ability to communicate to them at a moment's notice. Um, the, the response at this scale can't be handled by a single person or a single team. So you really do need a coordinator. And that coordinator for us ended up being the cyber team for DLA, ended up taking on that coordinator role. So then I could focus on certain things, our engineering teams could focus on things, marketing teams should focus on things. So focus is important. You know, every word matters, time's not in your side. I remember one of the quotes my CEO said at, at the time at about two in the morning. We had so many people reviewing what our 10K was. He said, yeah, uh, we just had reviews. They put a comma in. That comma cost us 20 grand. Um, but it, it, the amount of legal um, looking at things and making sure everything was right. 
but don't expect this to be the end. Uh, prepare for you know, the weeks ahead. This is only the beginning. So what happened in the first week? Uh, we organized into different teams and with a leader on each one of them. Uh, engineering had a team, so how did they get in? What happened? How did our code get affected? What was going on with the build system? All of those things, that was their role. That was their lane to stay in. IT, how did they get through our IT controls? Now, we had very reasonable IT controls in place. We were spending kind of more on the security side than the industry. Um, and they got through. So were my security controls good enough to thwart the Russian SVR? Absolutely not. They were not. They got through. They were able to insert code into the back end. So a lot of our push forward beyond the incident is to be exemplary. And we'll talk about kind of how we do that in different places. Uh, business escalation and customer outreach. So this went live on Sunday, essentially. By Monday morning, we were getting calls from every nation of the world and every special project of the world. Remember, at this point in time, we're trying to develop the, the antivirus or the virus for um, antivirus for COVID. So first question on U.S. government's mind was, does anybody involved in, uh, I can't remember the name of the project, um, but anybody involved in the creation of the, vi the uh, antivirus um, affected? That was one of their first things. They gave us a list and said, hey, anybody here on the list? Then different governments are saying, hey, who, who's involved? With, who, who in this country is involved? Who in this country is involved? Then large customers want to have meetings and understand what's going on. So business escalation, customer outreach, critical. And being prepared to handle those escalations, very, very critical at that time. Uh, communications. Um, we had not done a test of this magnitude, uh, but we knew we had to communicate en masse. So we, we stood up uh, websites, we stood up banners on our websites, we pointed people to information, we had FAQs. So we're updating that information constantly over the, uh, over the weeks afterwards. And you know, one of the reasons why you end up with so many long nights, um, and just the other thing you expect is, uh, is nights, you know, days start at seven, six, they go until, you know, three in, the, three in the morning, basically every morning. Reason being is you're doing so much during the day, meeting with customers, meeting with governments, meeting with the FBI, meeting with system, meeting with everybody. Then when do you get time to review all the documents that you want to push out? That's at one in the morning. So and they need to be done. So you just have to assume that that is the life. Um, so law enforcement absolutely involved. Um, more pushing information to law enforcement. And you know, law enforcement was after the attribution side of the world. So we were pushing information to them. Really wasn't res in, involved in the response as much. Uh, engaged additional help. So one of the things that we found was that we needed help especially on the um, uh, on the build system model and investigating our software development practices and where the builds may have been um, uh, affected so um, CrowdStrike great team great threat hunting team not developers per se not really experienced in the development world so KPMG forensics team came in and focused there they essentially looked at every check-in for two years. They started looking for build environments. They started looking for build systems with our teams and, and looking all over, all over, could we find a build system that had the code that actually got inserted? Uh, it turned out in February, we found a build machine that had crashed because of other mechanisms that got backed up. Since that build system crashed and was backed up, we actually found the source to Sunspot and found the source to uh, super, uh, uh, Sunburst and Sunspot. So we found the insertion point. Turned out the code that they inserted into our environment, they had decompiled. So they built it, compiled it, decompiled it, and then inserted it into our system. So all markers were removed, but it was still yeah, from a researcher's perspective, you never find the code. So actually being able to find a code was a big deal. Didn't tell us much because we had already decompiled everything ourselves, but it was still very interesting to be able to see that we found that. So don't be afraid in one of these instances to 
you know, engage additional help. Also in, involved Chris, Chris Krebs and Alex Stamos. Chris gave us entry points into the defenders of the world. And that was a big thing. He gave us introductions to be able to talk to everyone. So um, the national defenders work slightly different across the world, but great missions, um, really still on the kind of pure mission side. Um, Communication, what we knew to the customers. You know, we told them what we knew, we told them what we didn't know. Uh, we put information online, we put FAQs online, we, we moved people to those, um, got people to those. We sent out mailing to every one of our clients or every one of our customers that we knew. One of the things that turned out um, didn't work well was we didn't have contact information for everybody. We had sales contact information for everybody, not security contact information for everyone. So. After incident, we put a, inside of our sales force, we now have a security contact, named security contact inside of every customer or every customer that gives us one. So that, that way we can communicate to the right people. But we were finding that we weren't getting to every client there. Um, so enable the support teams. So you have to remember when this was going on. Our support queue was going like crazy. I think at one point it was 19,000 deep. So we're looking at this support queue that is growing and growing and growing. We're trying to get back to everyone. And we have a business escalation model that says, okay, for certain customers, for certain things, for certain, you know, anybody said I'm a government of the world, we would talk to them, those types of things. But it was all, all, all outreach. Um, yeah, so the world is on fire. Um, great research being done. Um, and since we would not talk to press, Press invents other things. They talk to old disgruntled employees. They talk to others. They try to get headlines. And just expect that, right? News is news, and they want news. And a lot of the researchers um, really did top-notch work, no question. Um, but it is, you have to understand different motivations occur during this um, this period of time. People want to use it to get a name. People want to use it to build their business. And you know, I'm not against commercialization by any means. It just is what it is. When I say that CISA was pure, CISA's own mi only mission was to amplify truth. Getting to that truth with them was a struggle, but once we got to it, they really did amplify really well. But we had researchers coming out of the woodwork of just trying to give different information or trying to you know, get in the press and get quoted, and all of those things happened. Um, so you just have to expect it. Um, let's see. Yeah, so if, you had, if we had fight, uh, gone through and tried to fight every mis, um, uh, communicated message that was coming over media, there's no way we would have been able to do what our job was. So, you know, the FBI did not raid our offices. That was in the press. We did not disrupt the voting systems. That was in the press. We did not, you know, all of those things happened. So, lessons learned. Uh, you'll be outnumbered. You'll be outclassed. You will be outmaneuvered. Uh, no question, right? You know, Microsoft was upset because we were mentioning that O365 had the potential to have be corrupted, okay? So in our case, what, what they utilized was an illicit consent grant, which means somebody had privilege, they put the illicit consent grant model into place in our O365 environment, and that enabled emails to be read. Um, model that they have you know, said exists, they said we were one of 60 when they um, first communicated during, during uh, testimonies, and then it turned out another 250 customers had that same model implemented it against them. But calling out that Microsoft 0365 had a problem was terrible, right, for Microsoft. And so when you look at out communicated, outnumbered, yeah, you know, we were dealing with Microsoft's um, communication. We were dealing with FireEyes. We were dealing with researchers of the world. So expect that you're outnumbered. You know, remember what others are going through. So no matter what you're going through, you know, it may have ruined my Christmas, but every one of our customers needed to research. Are we using SolarWinds? Are we using an affected version? So even though the truly affected ones that were exploited was 
you know, what we say now is under 100, right? We're truly exploited by this. Um, everybody in the world was looking at it. So we ruined everybody's Christmas. And remember that uh, when you're doing things. Bring in the correct partners. Um, and don't be afraid to change partners or add partners as you need. Create escalation models for each focus area. Don't fight the small stuff. Uh, there's so much false stuff uh, going on. It's OK not to have the answers. Um, Investigations tr take time, but it, it's important to be aggressive and don't miss things. And really grow a hard shell. You know, if I listened to all the bad things that were being said about me during this kind of time frame, I wouldn't have been able to get anything done. So essentially, you have to just turn off press and focus on the customers and get things done. The months that followed. Um, so. Investigation continue, um, threat hunting, KPMG, uh, scrubbing the build systems and code repositories. Uh, we continue with, with FBI briefings every time we, we found something meaningful. We essentially followed up on every anomaly that you see within the environment. So CrowdStrike, KPMG, in our environment till about May, deeply, so they find stuff. Now, expect them to find things and expect that your list of things to fix to be pretty big. Uh, we found the source and we made it available in February. Uh, we testified for the House and Senate. Um, we expanded customer meetings to include governments of the world, industry groups, everyone. So we went out there and purposely targeted the ISACs of the world. We purposely targeted any group of individuals that we could get to. Um, you know, we were having meetings with you know, 800 people. So, and the meetings focused on, you know, this is what we know, this is what happened, you know, this is what we're doing about it. Um, we implemented an Orion assistance program, so we were helping anybody that needed to upgrade and doing it out of our dime. So it said, you're running an affected version, let's help you get off of that. So we did that on, you know, basically paid for that. Um, we, one of the big things that people didn't see is we revoked our, prime, our, our signing cert. <coughs> um, so the, the cert that was utilized to sign those builds between March and June, we revoked. And that revocation process, um, we used the same cert to sign many of our other products. So what we had to do is rebuild every product solo and sell and ship a new one out. And do it quickly. Um, certificate authorities are very reasonable and you can work with them. The first date they gave us was like five days. And we were able to talk to them and negotiate to about a month. But you know, don't think the first answer is the right answer because there was no way we could get everything rebuilt in five days. Um, and this, it was a very good plan to you know, basically revoke our cert. So therefore, those versions that were affected will not be able to run without warnings anywhere. Um, created a two-way build products process. So we quickly said, okay, this, this affected our build environment. So what can we do? So January 25th build implemented two ways. So essentially we go from source code, uh, build process, pipeline to product. We now decompile the product, check the hashes for every source file and the hashes for every library, and then compare them and don't ship until all of those compares are done. Now, slightly different between different language. So that was January time frame. Uh, we're now on to three-way build processes. So we have three pipelines for, for build. We have a security pipeline, we have a validation pipeline, we have a development pipeline. Anytime we do a build, a production build, we build three times, no one person has access to each of those builds. And then we, um, so you have security associated, but then we compare those three builds. There's some white papers listed at the end of this that go into details on the build process. Um, but we also submitted that back to open source. Um, we really finished the inf information on investigation about May and then published the root cause analysis. So lessons learned. Um, be humble, be honest, share what you can. Take ownership for it. Right? It happened. So there's no way you should be able to hide from what happened. Um, develop a plan to tie everything together and partner with others to help, help with the experience. So our plan to kind of tie our response back was titled Secure by Design. And that moniker is kind of where everything fits. You know, if you have a cool name, expect it to be utilized. And it is 
So Microsoft came up with the attacker name. How many know what it was? Yeah, it was Nubelium. So do you remember Nubelium or do you remember SolarWinds? So, <laughs> so you'll see everywhere in the press, SolarWinds attacks, uh, or attacks email for Department of Justice. SolarWinds attacks this, SolarWinds attacks this, as opposed to the, SolarWind, the, the people that attack SolarWinds have also attacked. So we got, uh, our name got very much tied together with the attacker. And a lot of press just kind of latches on to that because it's easier. Um, with additional research focused, additional vulnerabilities be found, so you, you have to be prepared to respond. So that, what that means is that when we had our incident, we had researchers around the world finding additional things into, the, into our products and reporting them. Some responsible, some not responsible. But you had to be ready to prepare with updates. You had to be able to be prepared to do those things. Be prepared to take hard questions, right? So, so many hard questions from so many people. Take the opportunity to become exemplary. Um, this is, you know, one of the big lessons, right? How do we, how do we come out of this? How do we come out of this with our, you know, our customers still loved our products. Our still customers still wanted to move forward with us. But how do we make sure that they're comfortable doing that? We be exemplary. So the build process, exemplary. Nobody does triple builds with, you know, all those verifications. Um, for you know, my own internal teams. I run three SOCs, or actually four. I have um, CrowdStrike SOC, I have SecureWorks, all the information goes into them. I have my own SOC, and I have KPMG doing low and slow, basically threat hunting against my environment. So more visibility into the environment. Yeah, people don't necessarily do that. We stood up our own red team for doing a lot of things. So when you can find ways to be exemplary in the market, do that. And share as much as you can with the community. Very, very critical. So final thoughts, uh, pivotal event caused many changes across the globe. Yeah, many CISOs thank me for helping with their budget. Uh, many CISOs thank me for surviving, right? Because I am, one, I am the one that lived. Um, so it spurred a lot of conversations on public-private partnership. You know, the executive order was a result of uh, what we went through. A lot of the information sharing uh, mechanisms that we're going through are a result of what we go, go through. So the event has caused some good on the outside. Uh, Increased, it, it has increased the level of transparency and expected of vendors. So we talk a little about, about contracts and other things. You know, the amount of information we're willing to share is much more than we were before the incident. Um, you know, just quickly, Ken Bible, CISO for um, DHS, um, he came to me and said, Tim, you know, understand you went through this stuff, understand these things. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you 12 questions, and I want them answered completely. And what I will do is I will ask anybody that is, wants to replace you to answer those same questions. So we publish these questions as well. But it was like, what's your network design? What do you use for tools? What do you, how do you protect the environment? How do you protect code? So as opposed to generic answers, I answered them very specific. I said, we run check marks and white source on every build. I have 44 pairs of Palo Altos that protect my network. I run Rapid7 for a vulnerability scanner. I have, so you name it, right? But stuff you would not normally do, that's what we did. And from a vendor perspective, that transparency is now expected by others. Con contracts have changed, and transparency is expected from others. So brought the supply chain conversation to the forefront, and we hope the lessons can help others, right? And that's the big thing that we can kind of take out of this. So lead by example, um, and here's a few links to some different resources for us. So I don't know how much time I've got for a couple questions. Uh, do I have two? Any questions from folks? They're going to make you walk. So the question everyone wants to know, Tim, is how did you save your job? Yeah, no, no, great point. So I would have fired me if I didn't have the right skills. All right, plain and simple. Now. Luckily, through my career, I had done a lot of different things. I had talked to a lot of people around the world. I was very comfortable talking in large environments. I was very comfortable taking ownership for things. Um, if you're a backroom CISO, start building those skills. 
because without those skills, you have to remember, I'm on, on the phone with the highest levels of you know, every major corporation in the world, sometimes with you know, hundreds of people on the phone and hard questions being asked that I had to answer. Develop those skills if you're a CISO because I would have fired me. I couldn't, I would, I would absolutely have fired me if I didn't have those skills. But I did, and I became essential to our response. And, you know, uh, Sudarkar was asked of that question, or our, our CEO was asked, asked that question, well, why didn't you fire Tim? He said, well, if I was gonna hire somebody, I would hire Tim. So, that was his answer. All right, question over here. Oh, perfect. <clears throat> Not a question, actually, it's a comment. Thank you. Thank you for your transparency and thank you for what you've done. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to say, you, you moved the needle. It did ruin everyone's Christmas and it became the poster child for lots of things. And the way you've handled this has been exemplary and should be a model for everyone else. So thank you, thank you for your transparency. Thank you very much. And remember, it takes time. So one, one, one final thought on that. Just remember that the press will be ruthless to you and until the corner is changed. It took about six months, maybe seven months, before that corner changed. So, you know, just keep going. And uh, they would eventually, as your customers do, they change and they, you know, the, the title, Unprecedented uh, Attack, Unprecedented Response, was the title of a CISO uh, magazine article um, that you know, that I was focused on, but the, um, the big thing was that the press had changed. They saw it as an unprecedented attack and they appreciated our response. So thank you everybody for your time. Appreciate it.